In a previous lesson, uh, we talked about the vault and how we can actually store our settings in a centralized secure place. But uh, let's go one step further, I would say, in terms of our overall security. Because so far, even though we have moved our application settings, our connection strings, all of those really uh, sensitive data, sensitive uh, credentials, APIs, keys, tokens, passwords, anything that you can think of, since we moved this uh, into the vault, so right now we can go back to our localhost 8200s, uh, log in with the secret, and go to our vault storage, and let's say we have our custom credentials uh, for the availability service uh, here. Uh, but when you think about, for example, storing connection strings, these sort of things, well, you might be wondering if uh, it's actually, if you can actually do these things better. For example, when it comes to storing, let's say we have the, the Mongo section and we have this sort of connection string. Right now, as you can see, it's even not using any sort of uh, password, um, but we'll get to that <laughs> anyway. Um, but is it possible to somehow um, maybe create this connection string on demand? Right, because when you start, start thinking about microservices world, um, usually quite common is that let's say you are sharing the same database cluster, so you would give to any user and a microservice the same connection string, for example, and if there is a leak, for example, for any reason uh, there is a leak when it comes to connection string or some shared password by many services, well, at first it might be difficult to actually identify who caused this leakage. Uh, because since, let's say, 10 or 100 microservices uses the same connection string or the same password, it's uh, sometimes very difficult to determine what was the root of this leak. And um, the, other, the other thing is that we would like to have this more grained, more granular control, actually, who has access to what, and maybe this, uh, this microservice will only have access to this database, not the whole cluster, so this, this, uh, this service would need some specialized connection string, or maybe this connection string should be valid only for an hour, not for a year. Uh, so yeah. a lot of potential issues that may, that may so, happen. So basically, what we would like to achieve is some sort of equivalent when it comes to uh, authentication and the authorization for the user. So if, mm -hmm. we, if you're familiar with the idea about you know, generating some sort of access token for the for the users. So once you actually log in, uh, the thing that actually happens underneath your system is you uh, you are granted some sort of access token, which will allow, which uh, is attached then later to the HTTP request. And quite common, the the token itself is valid for some period of time. Yeah, right? so, so we don't expiry. Yeah, so it has some expiry date. So we don't uh, we want to prevent the situation in which we simply uh, generate this. Uh, allow this access token which is valid forever simply because there might be some sort of leakage someone could simply stole this put some men on the middle uh, attack and we would be uh, would go into a situation in which we can we, we could have this uh, security break so the same idea would be simply put into the secrets mm -hmm. so we would like to have this ability to simply generate the credentials on demand and put some expiry so once again, we could simply regenerate this uh, once we would have the... Yeah. So just like you said, just like with the users and the access tokens. So let's say we have our microservice and the service wants to talk to the database or maybe yeah. RabbitMQ or some sort of infrastructure or some other service. And let's say maybe instead of keeping this connection string uh, in this single place, the same connection string for a service, even though it's actually quite secured when it comes to keeping them, let's say, in this vault, in this key value storage approach and operating the upsettings, uh, we could actually ask some tool, and this tool once again will be vault, to like dynamically generate this connection string for us, right? Which will have some expiry. It can be five minutes, can be an hour, can be a month, whatever we can think of. And this connection string will be like unique only for the service. So if this connection string I would somehow leak, then we can easily identify which service causes leakage. That's first thing. Another thing, even if this connection string, uh, for example, someone gains access to this connection string, the person that shouldn't have the access to the connection string, then if there is some expiry, some, you know, some expiry like maybe an hour, then after this hour, once it's expired, this person will not be able to talk to the database anyway. So we have like two very nice benefits. Just like you said, the same with the tokens. So, 
instead of just directly calling our database with the connection string coming from the app settings file or some uh, environment variable, what we want to do instead is at first call this credential store to give us this connection string in that case. Then we can actually use this uh, dynamically generated connection string uh, to talk to the database. And if it turns out that this connection string expires, we can always ask the credential store to, hey, um, make this connection string valid for one more hour maybe. Okay. Or maybe remove this connection string. I don't want to use it anymore and no one else should actually be, be able to access this connection string. So just okay. remove this. So at this point, I have three questions. So first one is um, because at this diagram mm -hmm. that we are showing, we have this credential store, which is responsible for generating the credentials, let's in this our particular example for the database. So the first question is uh, whether is it some sort of uh, credential store responsibility to be aware about the fact what database we are picking and how to construct the cr credentials or is it uh, some sort of application uh, uh, we need to provide this capability to because the credential store needs to know somehow how to generate this yeah so for example when it comes to the vault uh, since we will be using this tool but there are also different tools if you look for example for something like vault database mongo or Vault Rabbit MQ, you will see that they have this secret engine okay. uh, related to this list uh, credential connection string uh, database uh, leading, and they have some sort of plugins for different databases. So there is MongoDB, there is Postgres, there is MSQL, and a few other databases. So uh, just both, a matter of the of, yeah, the of the engine. The the engine has to be aware of the uh, of the database they want to use because it needs some sort of plugin to construct the connection string and so on. Uh, but actually, uh, it's even uh, possible to write your own plugin, for example, for Vault, if you want to have some some sort of different database that they do not support uh, yet. Okay, the second one would be uh, the performance, since, mm -hmm. of course, we can see that now, instead of having this one connection between the service A and the database, first we need to fetch the data, for this, the actual connection string from the credential store. So does it mean that with every uh, let's say round trip to the database, I, I need to ask my credential store first and how this will affect the performance overall. Uh, no, um, we'll just, uh, we'll just cache it and just like you would do with the access token. So when you receive the access token for the first time and okay. it's validated, you would uh, usually keep this in the, for example, memory cache in your app. So the same with the connection string. So you ask it for, ask for this connection string once. Uh, you just uh, check this uh, expiry, for example, is an hour, right? So I will put it into the cache maybe for an hour. And then when I see that the time, uh, the time has come to refresh this connection string, I can either ask for a new one or extend the expiry for the same connection string, remove this, okay. or I can uh, just um, tr do some sort of simple try catch. And if there is, for example, connection string error or some connection error come from database, then I know that I should refresh my connection string and retry the same query that I just sent to the database. So, uh, so we will just basically cache it. So this actually uh, partially uh, uh, answers my third question, which was how we determine the expiry. So yeah. basically, once I actually, assuming that we'll have this expiry put into the cache, we'll simply once we would ask for data, we would, we would know that there is nothing in the cache because it's ex already expired. So we'll simply double clear sign. Yeah. Or as you mentioned, there's some sort of try cache. Yeah, we have these two options. The same one uh, that is with the access tokens. Let's say there is access token, uh, I getting 401 unauthorized error from this API, then I need to know, that I am, that I know that I have to ask for the new token, for example, using some sort of refresh token. Okay. So I could do, I could have some sort of timer just to make sure that I never go or pass beyond this expiry date, which, so for example, every 30 minutes I will ask for a new token. If I know that, for example, it's valid only for an hour or 40 minutes, mm -hmm. or I just have some sort of try catch and refresh this connection string whenever there is an error uh, already happening. Yeah, cool. So few different uh, ways that we can deal with the with this uh, leasing or recreating the connection string. So that's the theory. Let's uh, see it in action. Uh, so the first thing that we want to do, since currently we are running our MongoDB without any authentication at all, so please don't do it into the production. <laughs> but uh, if you look for some statistics, it turns out that actually a lot of people uh, out there, and also I did this once when I've been playing with MongoDB, uh, just run their MongoDB fully open to the outside world on some virtual machine and there are some bots, scrappers running through the different IP addresses and they will just, they will simply find out that you have your MongoDB port opened and, and they will your go data is encrypted, and your right? data is encrypted and you have to 
pay some sort of uh, Bitcoin or a cryptocurrency to get your data back. Yeah. So uh, uh, just try to run the database, give it a day, and most likely you will see the same. So please, uh, please don't do it. Um, so what we want to do now is we want to enable the uh, authentication on the database level. So what we want to um, the way we can do it is that if we go to our Paco and then uh, compose directory where we have our infrastructure YAML file, let me just open this one. And if we go to the Mongo section where we have defined our MongoDB, uh, let's just simply uncomment this environment uh, environment part, which will actually set the default credentials um, required by, by the MongoDB from that point on to the root and secret. So we have to use these credentials to talk to our database. Otherwise, we'll get we'll just not be able to connect to this uh, database. So let me just save this file. And now we need to restart the MongoDB. So let's just go to the compose. We can actually um, stop the whole infrastructure. So let me just do minus F infrastructure down. And before you do it, just make sure that you remove your Mongo volume uh, because this is stored on the drive, the configuration as well. So just make sure that you run something like Docker volume RM and then your compose Mongo file. So this was our default volume. Uh, use it by the use it by the Docker Compose for running MongoDB, and now simply just Docker Compose minus F, and then up minus D. So let's restart our MongoDB, just like that, and let's open our Robo3T to connect to the database. And well, I'm getting now fail to execute this databases command. So it seems that my database is working, but I can't connect to this one, which is what I would expect. So let me just edit the settings, go to application and simply provide perform authentication and my root and secret as the password. So let's save, connect, it works, okay? So now instead of actually, instead of actually keeping this uh, credentials here, so for example, what you would usually do in this scenario is that we have the connection string for MongoDB and let's just put the root and then call on secret at localhost, okay? So if I run the app now, doing it this way, it will work. So we can just give this a try. So let's see, um, let's run dot uh, run through our uh, console. It just start the app and let's just try to perform some simple request just to see that the data is uh, will be added to the database. So let's go to our rest file. Let's uh, create a new resource with ID one. Let's make a pause request. And yeah, do one created. Let's see, the data should be there. Here's the service, here's data. It all works, okay? If I remove this uh, from the connection string, if I make it this way, and if I restart the app, we'll of course get an error. So let's give this another shot. Don't run, and let's try to do the same. So let's do post. Just wait until it starts, okay. Once again. And yeah, four, 500 error because we haven't, we don't handle this sort of error, at least for now. And if you look at the logs, you will see that there is some command requires authentication, right? So let's see how we can actually use Vault uh, to give us this uh, possibility of uh, creating our dynamic connection string like ad hoc, like per, per request. So let's go to the Vault and let's go to the secrets engines once again and let's enable a new engine, right? We, we have restarted the whole infra, so that's why you're not seeing here the previous key value storage, which All we right. have already disabled. So let's enable a new engine. Yeah, I just need to refresh this one. Most likely, so secret, sign in, enable a new engine. Let's go here to the databases. So as you can see, we can also use RabbitMQ. For example, we can have the similar idea for our message broker, but we want to go with the databases. So let's click next. Let's just uh, keep the default path for database and let's enable engine. Okay, so we have our database engine, and now we actually need to tell Vault to somehow enable our uh, Mongo plugin, all right? So we can do it for the CLI, and we can uh, go to the Vault CLI either by the console, and we'll actually have to, the easiest way would be just to, through Docker run or start a new container that would, uh, you know, uh, with the interactive mode to- uh, Attach to the- Attach to the, to the, to the okay. CLI container. Uh, but we can also uh, run the CLI from here. So we just extend, expand this uh, console icon there. We have our basic Vault console there. And let's go to the VS Code. 
and under docker images file, once again, the same file uh, where we talk about uh, in the previous episode in which you can find the vault settings, for example, for running the vault server mode and so on. Down below here, you'll find this vault secrets and there is this uh, the one for the databases, right? So we are using currently this engine for databases that you have already seen. And uh, now let's actually take this part of code. So this will tell the vault that we want to have some custom configuration that we call MongoDB. And this, will, this one will use the Vault MongoDB uh, plugin. So it has to be some built-in plugin or okay. we just build this plugin on our own. And then we uh, tell the Vault what are, what are the allowed roles. So we can think of well roles, just like the user roles. So we could provide him some services names or whatever we can think of. And of course, there can be multiple, multiple roles provided. So we have the allowed roles. And finally, we have our connection URL, right? So this will be the template for our connection string. So the username and the password. And by default, this will be root and a secret. Uh, but if you want to be even more secure, you can actually tell the vault to load this from a, from a different file. They have this sort of uh, uh, console templates, as far as I remember, that's what they call them. So right now we just copy and paste this one to the CLI. But like I said, we can just uh, tell the vault to load this secure credentials for a database even from a different file whenever when we actually config, uh, configure the vault. So, um, or I believe that we could simply load this from vault as well, but from yeah. the, some sort of section yeah. defined yeah. in there. Yeah. But for now, for the simplicity purposes, we'll just uh, copy and paste this one. So let me just paste this one to the vault CLI. Uh, so let's get back here. Let's we'll just control uh, and enter. All right, so success, data written, all right? I have one more thing regarding mm -hmm. the plugins itself. So assuming that we would have a database, some sort of you know exotic database that has not the official plugin defined. So is it some sort of registry in which we can simply put this plugin or uh, we need to store it somewhere else? Yeah, so uh, if you go to the, the vault documentation, uh, they have some, they have this interface that okay. you can implement to actually uh, add your plugin and then uh, you just put it into your into this uh, into this plugins uh, plugins package, and you just sort of register this one in okay. the in the vault in the vault plugins. So actually, you just uh, call this vault right, and it will add this plugin. And yeah, that's pretty much it. But uh, I mean, the most common ones databases are supported here. So I think for the most of the people, what they see here will be actually enough. And I'm pretty sure that you can find also a lot of plugins out there in the network. So usually, I guess that there will be like no no, no issue with finding no the issue with finding particular plugin. Uh, cool. So um, all right. So we have our uh, we have our configuration written. So now let's get back here. And what we are telling uh, the vault now in the next step is that so we have our database plugin and. Here's our role. So we, in the previous step, we told uh, we told the vault uh, this configuration for MongoDB that we will allow this uh, availability service role. So right now we just want to create this role for our MongoDB, and here, as you can see, there are these creation statements. So actually, uh, this is like Mongo specific query. So in that case, we are calling that we'll just uh, create a new role for the database availability dash service uh, with the read write capabilities. All right, so this is like a, a query specific for the particular database. All right. And here is our time to leave. So by default, this will be valid for an hour and we can uh, extend uh, extend this for maximum time of 24 hours, right? So after 24 hours, if we may ex just keep extending this uh, collection string to 24 hours, after the time, we will not be able to actually extend this lifetime anyway and we will need to ask the vault for the new connection string. So we can uh, just uh, do some, we can actually adjust this one to our needs. We can uh, have this max TL for days, weeks, and so on and so on. So let me just take this uh, part. And let me just put it, uh, put it there. All right, so we have our, uh, we have our configuration, our custom role written to the vault. And actually, the last thing that we need to do is that we need to ask the vault to read our uh, to read our connection string. So let's see how we can actually 
generate this uh, connection string, this dynamic connection string. So as you can see at the usage section, there is this vault read database, credentials, uh, and the role. Okay, so let's uh, try out this one. So for our database, if we copy this here, we'll ask for read database credentials, and we will ask for availability dash service. And here are here is our connection string, right? So we just ask the vault to give us a connection string. There is a password. There is a username. This long one, as you can see, with some sort of expiry, some sort of timestamp. Okay. So let me actually take uh, copy this username now uh, to our Robo3D. Let's make a new connection. So let's call this one uh, localhost vault, for example. And let's paste our username here. And let's paste our password here as well. So in this case, uh, so in this case, we are generating the credentials for the MongoDB uh, on some sort of behalf of the user defined within this uh, Vault CLI, right? So I, yes. I defined the, this, this user to be capable of uh, both writing and reading. And since I performed this on the CLI, I have new, some sort of user created with this with this, uh, yeah, you have roles. you have basically like a configuration, and a configuration has set of roles, yeah. and you're asking now the Vault engine to give you for this particular role to execute this statement, and in this statement you said that you want to yeah. have your Mongo, like you want to be able to uh, have this. Uh, but it's happening some sort of on behalf of this user particular, which was defined. Mm -hmm. So okay, this makes sense. So let's just uh, yeah, I have copied these credentials. Let's save and let's try to talk to our database. So let's do connect. And as you can see, we've just connected to the local host. Once again, we can actually open our availability service database. And if we were to actually start other, other services, uh, we wouldn't be able to you know, open different databases because we simply stated that our service, our role, should be able only to read and write to this database, right? So this is also nice because right now we can only, we only have the role for our uh, particular database, our particular microservice right. as well. So let's try to see how we can actually integrate with this this with our app, right? Because uh, we can do it manually, but I can believe that no one <laughs> wants to copy and paste these this connection strings. Maybe and some DevOps guys would yeah, be Yeah, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I'm kidding. So um, let's go to our app settings once again. And down below here, you will find this list section and we'll see like what the code does behind the scenes. Uh, but there is the list section, uh, which is uh, some sort of dictionary. So we have some sort of key. We can call this uh, whatever we want. We'll just call this one Mongo. And we have our database, uh, which is the type. And then we have the role name. So the role name is, is, of course, the same name as this one. So we want to ask for the connection string based on this role. And one more thing that is important is that uh, besides having this enabled and have this uh, auto renewal to true to actually automatically extend this uh, connection string lifetime, have we have template. this we have this template. So what this template will do for us is that it will uh, replace the actual connection string. So it will replace the Mongo connection string here with this one with this template. So it will um, just uh, put there the proper username and the proper password. And of course, if you want, we can have some even uh, extended template maybe for uh, for our server name. But usually the server IP address is not that, uh, I would say, vulnerable or, yeah. or some sort of uh, secure value. So we want to ask, uh, we want to just uh, replace this username and password by our app. So let me just go to the AppStings local JSON. Let's just enable uh, the vault and let's just enable this Mongo uh, leasing, this uh, leasing part. So let's just switch this one to the true. And here is our lease. And let's actually start, uh, let's start the app and let's see if it will, and let's check if this one will work. And then we'll see what actually the code does uh, behind the scenes. So the app has started. And we should be able now to actually add the new resource. So let me go to the REST client once again. Let's just send this ID to, for example, two, so it's unique. And let's call polls add resource. So it worked. We have it created. So let's open database, refresh this one. And yeah, there's our data. 
So it works, okay? Whether it's this connection, this connection is the same, the same database. So let's tab it up. And let me actually run this one uh, in the debug mode. Okay. So let's start this one in debug mode. And I want to put a particular breakpoint here. So in our extensions, where we have admon, glad redis, and other sort of infrastructure, let me just uh, go to the uh, decompiled code. We'll see the code in a prettier version in a moment. Let me just go to decompiled code so I can put the breakpoints there. And here, when we are actually calling our, when we are actually configuring our IOC container to set up database, the Mongo client, and all this stuff coming from the Mongo driver library, let me just put a breakpoint, for example, here, or actually even, we can put it there. Maybe it will, it will be more visible in this place. So there is our breakpoint and let's start the app once again. Okay, so right now we just hit this endpoint. Here are our, here's our Mongo setting options. And as you can see at the connection string level, here is the Mongo connection string, right? So it will somehow replace uh, okay. by, uh, by this uh, extension. So we have the connection string uh, that we expect to have, this long connection string with some unique username and this uh, uniquely created password for us by the Vault database integration. So it will, of course, work. So now let's uh, take a look uh, in a prettier version of, the, of this code, what it does. So let me just switch to the uh, Convey package. Uh, and previously we had this add vault async, which was just the integration for calling, uh, for reading our application settings from the vault. And if we scroll down here below a little bit, what you will find is that we have this options list. So if we have this options list enabled, and if there is any list defined in this dictionary, we'll just try to prepare this new configuration uh, for, this, uh, for this list. So even previously, you would find here this console write line, this log, simple logging that we've just started deleting for Mongo as a key and a database type. And if we go here, let's take a look. We have our uh, we have a few extensions for different like database or actually the different engines coming from the vault. Here is the database engine. So if you take a look at this integration, you'll find here that what it does, it basically asks this uh, database engine coming from Vault. And once again, we are using this uh, Dotton library, this Vault Sharp to talk to the Vault behind the scenes. So we are asking, hey, give me the credentials. And then once we receive these credentials for this particular role name, which in our scenario is the availability service, we will simply uh, create this uh, create this simple dictionary in which we store the username and the password coming from the credentials. Okay. So if you take a look at these credentials, you will find this credentials dot data and some other settings as well. And here, for example, for the database will be will be usually the password and username. But for example, if you were to go, let's say, for the console secrets or for the Azure secrets, you would find that under credentials there will be like different data. For example, like client ID, client secret. So depending on the Vault engine, you will find different type of credentials here. So we are setting our credentials for the database. And the way that this templating works is uh, simply calling this replace method on a string, like the simplest way that you can think of actually replacing some sort of string. So once we have our credentials uh, returned here, we can just go to the set templates and this will actually replace the string, right? So here we are replacing our string so this one will replace this particular uh, template using username and password by using the provided username and password from this Vault database engine integration. And once again, we will add this to the overall configuration, right? So we have our configuration there. We'll just add this to this uh, uh, configuration. And finally, we will just add this configuration to the ASP.NET Core configuration builder. So we are just replacing the already, let's say, loaded configuration from app settings, environment variables, or even from the vault itself, like we did in the previous episode. And finally, we are replacing our connection string with this uh, particular uh, username and password for this dynamically generated data. All right, so to sum up, basically once we bootstrap the application, mm -hmm. since we have this vault sharp library, this allows us on the C sharp level to determine the 
particular engine. So in our case, that was the database, of course, based on the label put into the app settings. So you determine that this was the database. Yes. You simply fetch the data uh, generated by the uh, on behalf of the our user defined in the vault. Mm -hmm. We had the newly MongoDB user and password generated for us. We simply had this template defined within the app settings, replace this, and load it into the configuration. So pure ISP.NET Core, yeah. nothing more. And one last thing that you asked about at the beginning of this lesson is that how we can ensure that we'll always get the valid connection string and how we can extend its lifetime. So, for example, here, we can do it in both ways, either by having this some sort of try catch. And if there is this, there is this let's say, uh, connection database exception or this sort of thing, we will just catch this exception and ask the vault for the new connection string or this sort of timer, this sort of timer background job uh, mm -hmm. approach. So here, if we open this uh, background service, once again, we have the ASP.NET Core background service for performing this vault checks for this particular configuration, like uh, in a, some sort of background thread, I would say. Uh, if we go to, uh, to this vault hosted service here, you'll find that what we are doing is that we are simply looping through, we just have a, like a loop, and we are simply going through all of the active uh, lists, lists. So okay. if there is any, uh, for example, database configured uh, as this, uh, uh, within this list settings section, we'll go through all of these lists, uh, lists, and we are simply checking if, if the expiration date uh, if the expiration of this connection string will happen before the next run of this loop in the background job uh, will take place. So let's say if I'm running my loop every five minutes and I will have my connection string expire in three minutes, then I will ask for the new credentials. Okay. So simply I'm just calling, uh, once again, using this Vault library, I'm just calling renew list async and Vault keeps track of this list by uh, its unique ID. So actually when we I ask for this list in the first place and uh, these credentials here we are also getting the list id so this is some sort of unique identifier that is uh, understood by the vault and we are just simply telling the vault hey please renew this list right so this connection string will be valid for let's say another hour or we can always ask for the new connection string if that's the case so it actually depends on us maybe we want to have only uh, like connection string always recreated uh, every time, and uh, so we want to have the new connection string every time, so we never ex like extend this one. So even if we think about security, this might be even better approach because if we periodically extend this lifetime, and if someone gets the access to this connection string, this person would also be able to talk to the database because we may be not even aware that we you know extend this lifetime and someone has the access. So we can even go uh, go down this road. So it's really up to us. I want to tackle yeah, this. Yeah, and one more thing regarding the the refreshing uh, the the data mm -hmm. which is fetched from the vault so once you actually refresh the uh, the data so let's say i have my mongodb user newly generated mm -hmm. for me how I, how can i actually uh, refresh this on the c sharp level because within the um, within the first bootstrapping of the application mm -hmm. you simply loaded this as a static file and now we need some sort of have some sort of way to put it also and update the c sharp object that will be used within the yeah. mongo and that's good that you asked it because if we are just extending the connection string, it's not a big deal. We've loaded the, uh, the connection string for the first time and it's still valid. But uh, if you would like to replace the connection string, it actually depends on the particular database uh, configuration, which uh, like eventually uh, is all about configuring our IOC container. So for example, for the MongoDB, if you look for something uh, like a Mongo uh, extension in which we configure our database, so most likely somewhere here at the IOC level, Maybe instead of registering this one as, as a singleton, uh, we would have to change this one to be a scope level or That's just register yeah. this one a little bit differently or maybe uh, inject, uh, inject this uh, options using this iOption snapshot interface uh, to our classes. Yeah, but most, so, most of the yeah. IOC, IOC uh, libraries will provide you this capability of providing some sort of factory instead of having the uh, the registering the actual implementation. So we can simply make the usage of this. So now mm -hmm. instead of uh, registering as a single tone, we can simply create some sort of factory function which will yeah. make the usage of this and seek, okay, so maybe instead of uh, fetching this from the file, I will simply look for f into my Redis cache or some other store that would have the newest version uh, of, for the user provider. Yeah, so for the, for example, speaking of MongoDB, it would be just a matter of, you know, changing this uh, Mongo client, which actually using the connection string. But if you are using, for example, SQL database, 
And let's say we are using just a Dapper library or a raw SQL connection, right? The Dapper anything else, some very light ORM or actually not an ORM, just a library. And we are just instantiating this connection string, sorry, this uh, SQL connection on our own. Well, we're just passing connection string there. So it's just a matter of injecting the, okay. the options. So uh, just to be aware, and that's good that you ask about this one. And uh, just to you know, be aware about this IOC uh, configuration depending on the database library. And yeah, just like we said, uh, whether it's Mongo, SQL database, NoSQL database, you'll find a lot of different plugins there. And this is actually very nice because from your microservices perspective, each service will, at first, like we discussed in the previous lesson, will have its own uh, centralized uh, storage for keeping all of the, let's say, application settings. Then we can have this one step, or like next another step in terms of security, by dynamically generating connection string so that each service will have its own connection string. If there is a leak, we can easily identify which service caused the leak. And if this connection string uh, you know, just leaks somewhere out there to the you know, uh, some person that should never access this connection string, if it has like short expiry, well, there will be no use. So we don't actually have to replace the connection strings in our whole infrastructure just because one connection string has leaked. We can just take care of this one. Just to remove this or yeah i would say that's very cool thing a uh, very cool approach and especially that the effort put to actually adopt this mm -hmm. is not that big uh, but the capability and uh, of, of this approach is quite uh, quite yeah. huge so uh, yeah. yeah just a matter very of integration cool. be, like between our asp.net core app and the vault itself but there are libraries for that we've built our custom extension with convey as well so yeah just uh just so we are aware that with security, it's always be better safe than sorry yeah. like with all the things in life. So that's it when it comes to the uh, to this uh, dynamic credentials. We'll simply move forward to the certificates. Yeah. And we'll have one, yeah, like you just mentioned, we'll talk about certificates and you will see another cool usage of the vault uh, in the next lesson.